know for a fact that he's a dynamite speaker. Eddie, Pastor Connors, will you come forward? The last seven words of Jesus is a reminder that the Lord will always have the final say. That's right. That's right. Recorded in John chapter 19 and verse 26 are these words. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he saith unto his mother, woman, behold thy son. Then saith he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that very hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. It is here, my brothers and sisters, that we are betwixt Jesus's divinity and his humanity. The son of God is also the son of Mary. The living water is thirsty. The one who came that you might have life is now faced with death. And more powerful than at any other time in scripture outside of the 40 day wilderness experience and the event at Gethsemane. Here we see Jesus on Calvary caught between his divinity and his humanity. Juxtaposed on the one side, he is 100 percent human. And on the other side, he is 100 percent God. And theologians demarcate this being the hypostatic union of God and man wrapped in the regalia panoply or armor of flesh. Here we see one of the saddest and greatest gripping moments on Golgotha's heel, which was Mary, the mother of Jesus, to watch her son be crucified. And she can do absolutely nothing about it. The statement that Jesus makes is traditionally called the word of relationship and it Jesus entrusts Mary, his mother, into the care of the disciple whom Jesus loved, that being the writer of this passage, John, known as the beloved disciple. Even in our lives, there are some people, if you be real, that we like, but there are others that we just love. Some people you celebrate, but there are others you just tolerate. And there's incredible tension here in the text by the cross where Jesus hung and it begs the question, where was Joseph, his father? There is no mention of him. Had he passed on? Is he still living? Why was he not there? According to the record, one only one of the 12 disciples was there at the foot of the cross, that being John the disciple whom Jesus loved. And it begs the question to all these great preachers and these saints of the gospel here, where were the other 11 disciples at the most critical and crucial time of Jesus's journey? Judas betrayed him, Peter denied him, others ignored him. You see, people can be so fickle that they'll only be with you on the mountaintop, but they'll scatter when you're in the valley. People are quick to surround you in your victory, but you can't find them in the daytime with a flashlight when you're struggling. You see, there were multitudes of people who flocked to Jesus when he was healing the sick, when he was raising the dead, when he was feeding the four and the five thousand. But now where those same folk when he's in need of healing and comfort. And here we see Christ forsaken and his great vulnerability. Scripture underscores that he was beaten so mercilessly that he didn't even resemble a man. Naked and in horrendous pain, he thought not of himself, but he was concerned for the well-being of his dear mother. This shows Jesus's humanity, the depth of love he had for his mother and the disciple into which whose care he entrusted her. See, you got to make sure that the right people are in the right hands because some people can be good to you, but not any good for you. Ah, uh, there is something infinitely moving in the fact that Jesus in the agony of the cross, when the salvation of the world hung in the balance, thought of the loneliness of his mother in the days of head. 
And here at the very end, we still see Jesus exercising love and care. He's dying, but he's still loving. He's hurting, but he's trying to give healing because even he, Jesus knew that although there is the love of God, the father, there was nothing like a mother's love. And although every mother is a woman, every woman is not a mother. Ah, can you for a few minutes just imagine what Mary is going through and experiencing during the crucifixion of her son? Yes, he is the son of God, but he's still Mary's baby. Jesus is the son of God, but he's still the son of Mary. This mother's love comes from the same Mary who wrapped him in swaddling clothes, laying him in a manger. This is the same Mary who looked for her baby boy, Jesus, when he disappeared into the synagogue. When the young precocious Jesus declared, I must be about my father's business. It's the same Mary who saw him turn water into wine, heal the sick, raise the dead, rebuke demons and evil spirits. She first looked down and gave Jesus tender love and care in the crib. Now she's looking at him with tear-stained eyes at her son strung up on a cross. Her baby boy was in a crib, now a man on the cross. In the crib, she could protect him, but on the cross, she could only pray for him. In the crib, she educated him, but on the cross, she can only watch as the Roman soldiers executed him. Her eyes see him as a man, but her heart still sees him as a child. Do I got a few mothers in here who understand? Can you feel the enormous intensity and emotion of Mary? You don't have to be a mother to feel this one because my savior is dying for me so I can live for him. And while she's looking at Jesus, he's still watching her. I just want to give word to somebody today. My dear brothers and sisters, whatever you do, don't you take your eyes off Jesus. Uh, yes, despite how much pain you have to go through, despite life being rocky, despite the cancer diagnosis, despite the tears that stream down your face, you better keep your eyes on Jesus. Let the haters hate. Let them call you everything but a child of God. But don't you, don't you, don't you, don't you take your eyes off of Jesus. And we see Jesus who represents black men in America being executed for a crime he never committed. From antiquity to present day contemporary times of Trayvon Martin, George Floyd, all the way back to our forefathers being brought forcefully here to these yet to be United States of America on slave ships to Emmett Till, Medgar Martin and Malcolm, uh, Martin Luther King Jr. to the King of Kings, Black men have always been in the crosshairs of this culture. And now Jesus is hung up on a cross because he defied the culture. Jesus is killed. He's assassinated by rogue Roman police officers who brutally, violently, and vehemently execute the Messiah who's a minority. Not only because his skin was a sin, but because he proclaimed to be the son of God and save us from our sin. There's no justice or peace for the Prince of Peace. I wonder, do I have a mother in this house who saw your child violently murdered, who witnessed your child being abused, a diagnosed with a terminal illness? Can you imagine the anguish, the sadness, the grief, and the utter catatonic and cataclysmic extirpation that Mary must be feeling while witnessing her son murdered for the world to see. Every woman in this house, can you empathize with this text? Because if you ever want to get a woman started, then just mess with her child. Mary and Jesus are caught in a catastrophic situation because all 
although Jesus is Christ, the anointed one, he is still the savior of the world. Uh, I got to get up out of here now. He is still the child who came from her womb. Now she must watch Jesus as he dies, but not just as he dies, but as he suffers while he dies. Oh, Mary, Mary, don't you weep because on the other side of pain is power. I will not leave you comfortless in distress. And I propose to you, why would Jesus call his mother woman? Because the phraseology seems as if Jesus is having a Tupac moment because he doesn't say dear mama. He says woman. Why would Jesus call a woman? It's not the best decision to call your mama by her name, much less to call her woman. Have you ever called your mother by her name? And I'm surprised you lived to see it. Uh, you don't want to get slapped because she brought you in this world. And come on now, don't you look at me in that tone of voice. She can show enough, take you out. He didn't call his mother mama. He called his mother Mary. He called his mother woman. And this is the second time that Jesus refers to his mother as woman. The first time is at the wedding at Cana to say, woman, what do you have to do with me? It's not my time yet. And the King James transliteration of the word woman makes it sound derogatory. But in actuality, in Hebrew, it means madam. It is sincere reverence. And from the cradle to the grave, from inception to conception, from crucifixion to resurrection, a woman has always been the focal point of Jesus's ministry. A woman has always been the focal point of his life, his leadership, and his legacy. And it is very plain to see that rather than being intended to express disrespect, it is intended to express love. Jesus looked at his mother, then he looked at John, then he looked back at his mother and said, you're losing one son on this side, but you're gaining another son on the other side. Because that term woman in Genesis 3 and 15, God spoke to the serpent and said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head. Uh, Mary was the woman who gave birth to the seed that bruised the head of Satan. And when Jesus says woman, he's referring back to Genesis because you're not just my earthly mother, but you release something supernaturally to bring victory that will translate in the life of my brother and sister. Oh God, I feel like preaching in here now oh, because the cross is liberation as Thomas Murray Burton said, the cross transforms the world and you can't even begin to imagine or fathom the ferocity of Jesus's agony. Scholars suggest that he was on the cross for nearly 36 hours and in his inexhaustible pain, he's not thinking about himself, but he's thinking about his mama. In his lifeless body, Jesus wasn't too busy dying that he didn't have have enough love to break the bands. He didn't reach for money. He didn't reach for power. He didn't reach to kill a Roman soldier, but he reached for his loving mother. When the seven inch nails were in between the radius and the carpal bone, which cut the media nerve, the nails were driven into the uh, plantar bone of his feet, which sent fire through his body. But as they said in Psalms, not one bone of his body would break. And the shock was more amplified and multiplied when Jesus adjusted his body on the 110 pound cross. Ah, uh, yes, he wasn't driven in the palm of his hand because it would have ripped, but he was driven in the wrist. Ah, uh, God, which is still a part of the palm of the hand. And his wrist would rotate and tap against the nail, which sent ferocious horrible horizontal and our 
allowed God vertical tremors and bulimic shock through his body. But the clawed grip of Jesus on the cross oh, said that he's got all power in his hand. And he looked at his mama in the midst of cataclysmic extirpation and spasmodic shock to the lungs. And he said, woman, behold thy son. Son, behold thy mother. I'm through lecturing now. Uh, but brother Moore, let's do a little bit more. I submit to you today that Jesus was not only addressing his mother Mary, but Jesus was also talking to the Canaanite woman. Jesus was talking, punch me in right quick, to the woman at the well. He was talking to the Canaanite woman. He was talking to the woman with the issue of blood. Jairus' daughter he was talking to. Jesus was talking to the woman caught in adultery. Jesus was talking to the woman with the alabaster box who washed his feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. Jesus was talking to the crippled woman, the widow woman of Nain. Jesus was talking to all the women in the bloodline, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba. Jesus was talking to my mama. Jesus was talking to every woman in this house. And when Jesus looked out, he said, woman, behold thy son. And it can be said that a man calls on his mama, not only in good times, but he calls on his mama in bad times. Behold, look at me and see that you grazed me to be a great son because you were great mama. It was a woman. If you testify today, who fed you. It was a woman who clothed you. It was a woman who prayed for you. My mama prayed for me. Had me on her mind. Took the time to pray for me. Jesus did not die for just for sin. But Jesus didn't die with sin. But he died for sin. God made him alive. But not a liar. God made him disobedient. But not the disobedient. God made him jealousy. But he's not the jealous. God made him witchcraft. But he's not a witch. God made him hatred. But he's not a hater. God made him drug abuse. But he's not the junkie. God made him spousal abuse. But he did not participate in domestic violence but whatever sin you committed he became he was nailed to the cross but the nails didn't hold him it was his love that held him and I want to thank God for saving me with power power Yes, yes, yes. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. Yes, that's what we need. Ooh, we.